chapter 1. Last Sunday, we looked at Joseph and how Joseph was a type of Christ. How he went through those difficult times in his life, but yet after it was all said and done, that he brought Israel out of, out of a very tough situation where there was a trout, there was no food. They went into Egypt to get the, the necessities of life. Uh, so that they can live, and uh, quickly they found out, Israel found out, that Joseph was alive. And uh, they all came into Egypt, the land of Egypt, where their lives were spared. They were taken care of, and God blessed. And, and there in the land of Egypt, Israel began to flourish, began to grow, uh, began to become strong. And uh, the Lord blessed them abundantly. And uh, there in the land of Goshen, they became very strong. And uh, they, they grew and uh, we know that in Exodus chapter 1, things began to turn. Things began to change. In fact, the Word of God shares with us here in Exodus chapter 1. Uh, verse 1, it says, Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob. So first of all, we find out here that uh, verse 2, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Iskar, uh, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Nephti, Gad, and Asher, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation, and the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. God blessed Israel. That's exactly what God said was going to happen, as God promised Abraham a seed that would multiply more than the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. And it goes on, verse 8, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Now how could that be possible? History was erased. They didn't know about Joseph. And uh, people question, well, how could this be possible? I mean, Joseph saved the lives of the Egyptians. He saved the lives of those in Goshen, Israel. And uh, how, how could this be? Well, history was wiped out because another nation came in and destroyed them. During the 20th or, or 12th dynasty, during the times of art, craftsmen, prosperity. Joseph lived during this time. It was during the dynasties of the 13th and the 14th Egyptians dynasty, which then began to decline. The 15th dynasty, there was Hykosos, invaded Egypt, stayed through the 16th dynasty. This was the Semitic tribe from Shem, the Asiatic descendants, is possibly that is when the pyramids in Egypt were built. The 18th dynasty was the new empire period in Exodus chapter 1 through 8. Uh, the Exodus took place during the 15th and the 13th century. So there was a group of people, the, the Hekasos, invaded Egypt at that time and totally wiped out all the historian facts and all the literature. Uh, the pharaohs of Egypt, first of all, was Thotmose III. He was the pharaoh of the oppression. And then Amenhops II was the pharaoh of the exodus. And it wasn't until after his death that Ramses came on board which was the Pharaoh after the Exodus. As you read scripture, Amenhotep II, he died in the sea when uh, Moses put his hands together and the sea closed in and all the Egyptians, as including the Pharaoh, all died. You know, if you look at Hollywood and you look at all those uh, films, they usually have Pharaoh, like the Prince of Egypt, which is the... Uh, uh, the um, Hollywood presentation through Disneyland. They have him uh, spared. And then also the Hollywood presentation that we've seen all throughout these years of uh, Moses and, and, uh, and everything. They usually have the Pharaoh. He lives through it and he goes back and uh, 
back to Egypt, but that's not true. He, he actually died. He was destroyed. That's Amenhotep II uh, during the Pharaoh of the Exodus. It wasn't until later Ramses came on board Pharaoh after the Exodus. So that's why uh, they did not know Pharaoh. He did not know Joseph, rather. And so it goes on to say, verse 8, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we are. They were getting nervous. God was blessing Israel. He was blessing them. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get thee up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them and their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pathom and Ramses. And the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor." And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Sephirah, and the name of the other Puah. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and to see them upon the stools, if it be so, or be a son, then ye shall kill him, and it is for a daughter, then he shall or she shall live. But the midwives feared God. So we see here Israel was in bondage. You know, it kind of reminds us of the picture that when we're born in the world, we're born in sin, we're born slaves, we're born captive to our sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What a picture. Left in bondage, no hope, no future. Can't do what you want to do. Can't build your own home. Here you are building homes for Pharaoh and for Egypt and not for yourself. It was bondage and hard bondage. It wasn't comfortable. It wasn't pleasant. And they began to cry out to God. They began to say, God, deliver us. Deliver us from this land of Egypt. They were told that they would be in bondage for 400 years. And here, first of all, as we look at this message here today, in light of Easter, of Easter I want to share with you, first of all, point number one, reared in the palace. The Bible shares with us here. In chapter 2, verse 1, And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took the wife, a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she did him three, or she hid him three months. And when she could not, or no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and, and uh, dubbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river brink. So the Bible shares with us that Moses' mother saw that he was a good child. Now, I don't know of any, money, any mother who looked at her child and said, man, is he ugly. <laughs> he doesn't look good at all. <laughs> I've never heard a mother say that. Uh, but here we have a child born, and she said, this is a goodly child, and I'm going to protect him. I'm going to save him. And the Bible shares with us that when she could no longer hold him and hide him, in verse 3, she, she made this little ark, little bulrush, and made this ark. And it says that he, she dubbed it with slime and with pitch. That word pitch is a reference to atonement, a covering. Do you remember the ark, Noah's ark? He pitched it with pitch within and without. A picture of the atonement, a picture of the cross. The ark saved the lives of all those who believed by faith in God. Saved their lives. A picture of the atonement, a covering for one's sin. Oh, I can see that Moses here, that little bulrush, that ark was pitched within and without. A picture of the atonement, a picture of salvation, a picture of freedom. 
that know that uh, Moses being placed in that ark and his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And you know, that thing started to float around, but the Bible shares with us, look in verse five, and the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along with the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maids to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Reared in the palace. What an education! Something that he was going to need to know in the future. God had a plan. He had a purpose. Here he is, a, a child who was protected, a child who was saved from, from wrath, from destruction, from death, that he might be a redeemer. That uh, he was one who was protected. He was one who God had a plan for. He was reared in the palace. He was taught over many things that were so important for him. What an education. An education is important. An education is, is uh, so important. That's why we have a Christian school here. For the purpose of training up young people. Not only in the education that we need to know. Like math and science and, and history. And, but also studying the word of God. To know what God's word has to say. That we might be drawn closer to him. That we'll have a desire to live for him. And to serve him. Education is so important. And you know, if you talk to me long enough, you know that I do not like public schools. I, I just don't. I, I, I just don't like them. But I really appreciate the Christian school who has the idea and the focus to train young people to, to uh, not only in the important things of this world today like math, but also according to the word of God. To learn to love the Lord. To learn to cherish and to grow up in a way that's pleasing and glorifying to God. Putting God first. Putting him first, realizing that education is so important. Moses had quite an education, reared in the palace, a goodly child in verse 2. He was, the ark was covered with pitch, a picture of the atonement. What a beautiful picture. And not only that, but Pharaoh's daughter took care of him in verses 4 through 10. And then we find in verses 11 through 15, look at this, tough times came along. He thought maybe he would be able to protect Israel. And it all kind of fell apart when he started to do things his own way. When he decided that he was going to do uh, something that uh, he thought might be a help. It says here in verse 11, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out onto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked... His way, this way, or looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he drew the, he, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. He supposing that now everybody knew, verse, verse 15, now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Reared in the palace. What an education. The ed top education that you could ever have. But yet he still realized who he was. That he was Moses. He was an Israelite. He wasn't an Egyptian. And then not only do we want to look at reared in the palace. But how about this one? Trained in the desert. Because it shares with us here in chapter 2. Beginning at verse 15. That uh, he ran. He heard that thing. He, he heard that uh, things were falling apart. But let's look at verse 15. The last part of it. And dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water. And filled the, trout, uh, the, the trough, trough 
to water that to water their flocks and the shepherds came and drove them away but Moses stood up and helped them and watered the flocks and when they came to to rule or to rule their father he said how is it that ye are come so soon today because normally it takes all day. You had to wait for all those shepherds to get done. They would push them away. They would uh, say, hey, no, you wait. I, we're going to do this first. But Moses comes along and uh, with his great strength, you know, he probably looked big and strong. And, and he was an Egyptian. He was dressed like an Egyptian. They, they, they knew who he was or not necessarily knew who he was, but because the way he dressed and he was probably strong, you know, he probably looked a lot like Will over here. You know, you don't want to come against him in a dark alley. He'll... You know, beat you up. <clears throat> so they said in verse 19 here, and they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And so he said, well, why, why, <laughs> Why did you leave them out there? Why didn't you bring them home with you? And, and uh, so the cry, it says here in verse 20, uh, it goes on to share with us that, and he said unto his daughters, and where is he? <laughs> Why didn't you bring him? Why is he that ye have left the man and call him that he may eat bread with us? And uh, we find in verse 23 that God begins to work. And it says, and came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. And the children of Israel reigned by reason of the bondage or sighed because of the reason of the bondage. And they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning. Now, isn't that a comfort? Listen to that. God heard their groaning. In other words, he had ears to hear. And he has eyes to see. He sees the bondage. He, sees the, he hears the cries. He sees the turmoil. This is his people. Israel, God's people. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. So in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through chapter 4, we see the call of Moses. The call of Moses, not only reared in the palace, but also trained in the desert. He was trained to take care of sheep. He, what? There's no better way to learn how to lead the children of Israel than to understand how to lead sheep. Wow, what a training. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert. And came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. I believe this is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. Before Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea, he spoke to Abraham through the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burned. So he walks before God and God tells him, the Lord tells him to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. What an opportunity. And as we look at the call of Moses, we first of all want to look at in, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, that Moses asked the question, who am I? Who am I to be asked of you to go and lead the children of Israel out? Look at verse 11. Moses said unto God, who am I? that I should go on to Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. I just killed an Egyptian man. They chased me out of town. Uh, who am I? I? I can't do this job. I, I'm not the right one for this job. I, I, I ruined things. But I think God was thinking that who better to do the job that God wants him to do? He was trained in Egypt. He was trained in the desert, taking care of sheep. God had a plan. God had a purpose. God had a reason. And that training is what helped him to do it. Not only does he ask the question, 
who am I? But he also asked the question, who are you? Because it tells us here in verse 13, look at this. And Moses said unto God, Behold, where I come unto the children of Israel, or when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they said to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God simply tells him, I am who I am. Look at verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. The great I am. Yahweh. Elohim. The God that created this world. So not only did Moses ask, Who am I? He also asked, Who are you? But thirdly, he asked, Why me? <laughs> Why me? Look. Look here in chapter 4, verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 13 says this. And he said, Oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Send somebody else. Why me? I can't do this job. But you know, God was about to give him the strength to do the job that God was asking him to do. Because, you know, God's not always looking for the most qualified. He's looking for the one who's willing to be used of God. Because God doesn't always use those that we think are most qualified. We see people in the world today and think, man, he's the man for the job. He's the one to do it. But if God's not calling him, if God's not calling, he cannot do the job. He is going to fail. Moses was a man who said, why me? God shares with us here in verse 14, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also behold the com cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. You know, Moses would have been far more blessed if he would have realized that God's the one that can help him through. That he can trust the Lord. That he can do what God asks him to do. I think he would have had far more blessings if he would have just obeyed. If he just would have said, all right, Lord, send me. Send me. Here am I. Send me. But Moses asked the question, who am I? Who are you? And why me? God used Moses in a very unique way. God blessed him. God used him in a way that, that I think we could be used today. If we realize who God is, if we realize he's the man that can help me through, he is the God that will give me the strength to do the things that sometimes I'm afraid to do because God used Moses in a very powerful way. God used him to bless and to release Israel from the bondage that they found themselves in. So not only do we want to look at reared in the palace, trained in the desert, but listen to this one, ruled in the Nile. Bible shares with us that Moses answered the call. He answered the call and he went to Egypt. And in, in Exodus chapter 5 verse 1, he says to Pharaoh, let my people go. Look at verse 1. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. That they may hold a feast unto me. In the wilderness. Look at chapter 12. You can keep your hand in verse, verse or chapter 5. But turn back to Exodus chapter 12. Here in Exodus chapter 12 is a verse I want you to see. Exodus chapter 12. And verse 12. Keep your finger there in 5. We're going to go through a little bit more. But it says, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. And will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. This is a reference referring to the fact that God was going to stand up against the gods of Egypt. That, that his wonders, his power will be seen far greater than all the gods of Egypt. 
As you think about that, let's look at the 12 different plagues that are found in the land of Egypt. When Moses presented himself before Pharaoh, and he looks at Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, I don't know your God. Neither will I let your people go. God even hardened his heart so that all the world will know that he is more powerful than all the gods of Egypt. In fact, in Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 through 24, the Bible shares with us that Moses, by the mighty hand of God and all his wonders, turned the Nile River into blood. This plague only happened in the land of Egypt. None of the Israelites were exempt. In fact, this was against two powerful gods of Egypt. Hapi, which was the spirit of the Nile, and Karam, which is the guardian of the Nile. They looked at the Nile River as their god. This was a powerful god that, that, um, that gave water to their land, which caused the crops to grow. The, the crops to grow so that their herds can live, so they can live. They looked at the Nile River as their god. They looked at the, uh, the Nile River as, as the most powerful God and that, that, uh, that they can trust in him. But what does God do? The Almighty, Elohim, he turns the Nile River into blood. Giving note to the Egyptians, your God's a phony. Your God can be defeated. Your God is just, a, just an imposter. I can defeat him. I am greater than he is. God was sharing through Moses that he was the Almighty. That he was the true God that was about to deliver his people Israel from the land of bondage, from the land of slavery, from the land that was not theirs. But not only the Nile River, but also look at Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. He sends in frogs. Frogs. You've heard of uh, wall-to-wall carpeting, right? Well, this was border-to-border border frogs. You know, they would walk around and they would step on a frog. Ribbit. They would open up the refrigerator and out comes a frog from their mango juice. How disgusting is that? That had to have been gross. This god is known as Hekwit, the form of a frog, and Hapi, which is the spirit of the Nile. These frogs came from the Nile. These frogs were many. And they, according to the Egyptians, was a god to worship. But the true and mighty God brought them into existence more abundantly than they ever saw before. And you know, as all those frogs were there in the land, and uh, it, it had to been disgusting, it had to been gross. You, you can just imagine Pharaoh's wife going uh, before him and saying, Pharaoh, you, you've got to get rid of these frogs. I mean, there are so, they're in my mango juice, they're on my pillow, they're in my blankets. You have got to get rid of these frogs. So what does Pharaoh do? He goes to the preacher. He goes to Moses and says, Moses, you got to get rid of these frogs. You got to get rid of them. So Moses says, well, I'll be, <laughs> finally, he's come to his senses. And Moses asked Pharaoh, when? <laughs> when do you want me to get rid of the frogs? And he says, tomorrow, tomorrow. Now, folks, if we're repenting of our sin, we're confessing our sin. We see our sin the way God sees our sin. We don't say tomorrow. We say now. We say now. Could you imagine Pharaoh going back to his wife? And his wife says, when is he going to get rid of those frogs? Did you talk to the preacher? Oh, yeah, I talked to the preacher. When's he going to get rid of the frogs? And Pharaoh tells his wife, tomorrow. Could, could you imagine her response? Tomorrow? Do you mean I have to spend one more night with the frogs? Why didn't you say now? We want to get rid of the frogs now. And they spent one more night because he did not see his sin the way God saw his sin. He didn't recognize God as a true and living God. But not only frogs, if you look in Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 through 19, you see a swarm of lice. And this one, and they're uncertain. It could possibly re be referring to the Egyptian priest and, and a plague on them. Then we also have in Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32, a plague of flies. These flies were known as a god of Uchit. 
a God who manifested himself as a fly. Now, could you imagine a man looking like a fly and they're worshiping it? They must have carved this image out of someone that looks like a fly and, and they bowed down to it, bowed down to a stone, a rock, an imposter. And God just simply said, I am more powerful than that stone that you have on the corner. I am the true and living God. Then we have in Exodus chapter 9 verses 1 through 7, a disease on cattle. And this disease also happened in the, in, uh, in, in fact, they were exempt. Israel was exempt from this one. I'm sorry. He was exempt. And this is Apis, the bull rever reverend as sacred, a sacred bull and cows, Pitta, Minravis, and Hathor. Many different gods that they worship cattle, they worship uh, the images. You know, you wonder why people are starving and they have cattle standing around everywhere. It's because they're worshiping them. They worship cattle rather than uh, realizing who the true and living God is. And then we have the plague of the boils, sores on man and on animals. This was Sekmanite, the goddess with power to heal. And then Serpibus, the healing god. And then we also have the destruction of crop found in Exodus chapter 9 verses 13 through 15. And this was Seth, the uh, protector of crops, and Newt, the sky goddess. And then we have the destruction of crops by locusts. And this is the god Isis and the god Seth, the goddess of life and the protector of crops. And then there was darkness. Darkness. This is the god of Ra, the sun god. And Atom, the god of the setting sun. These gods, according to Egypt, were so powerful. But our God overcame them all. He defeated each one of them by his mighty hand and his great wonders. Pharaoh, still, his heart was hardened. It was hardened. So God tells Moses, now is the time. Now is the time. And they instigated what is known as the Passover. The Bible tells us that God was going to destroy and take the life of every firstborn in the land of Egypt and in the land of Goshen where Israel lived if they did not follow the instructions of the Passover lamb. It shares with us here in Gen or Exodus 12, 12. Exodus chapter 12. Again, the same verse I read just a little bit ago. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. So God tells Moses what he should do and what he needs to do. In Exodus chapter 12, Beginning at verse 21, the word of God says this, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop. This is plants that grow in rocky areas. It's a hard and with many, many different sticks, hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in onto your houses to smite you. So the Passover lamb was a picture of what Jesus Christ was going to do. In fact, this evening sacrifice took place at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's when they were to sacrifice the Passover lamb. And that is exactly the time that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. 3 o'clock in the afternoon. What a beautiful picture. This was a picture of what Jesus Christ was going to do in the future for the sins of lost mankind. This Passover lamb was shed his blood three o'clock in the afternoon 
so that Israel could be set free. They have remembered it for ever since. And each time they do it, they sit down to eat. They have a rod in their hand. They, they, they are fully dressed, a hat on their head, and they eat quickly. They eat all of it because they're about to leave the, the, the torture, the enslavement of Egypt. Set free. And as a result of the, of the Passover lamb, they left on Saturday. And hence, that is when they worshipped the Lord, the, the, the Sabbath. That's why the Sabbath is set out so important for Israel. Because they remember the day that they left the land of Egypt. We worship on Sunday because we remember the crucifixion of our Savior. And the day that he arose from the grave, Moses was used of God to deliver Israel from Egypt. A beautiful picture of being set free to be purchased from the slave market of sin. That we might have eternal life and spend eternity with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a powerful story. First of all, he was reared in the palace, trained in the desert, and he ruled in the Nile. God blessed Moses. Delivered Israel from bondage. From bondage. After 420 years, set free because of Moses and the way that God used this willing servant, a servant of God. What a beautiful picture of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. That we're no longer slaves to our sin. We are set free. Just as Israel was set free, we are set free through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. In light of Easter, Joseph, a type of Christ. Moses, a man of God who set Israel free, just as Jesus Christ has set us free. Next Sunday, I want to share with you another message that God's laid upon my heart. A beautiful picture of the cross of Calvary and what Jesus Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God today. And for the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us to be your servant. Just as Moses was a servant of God. Just as you used him. Oh, it was out of his comfort zone. He was not comfortable. Just like many of us. We're asked to do things too that we're not comfortable with. But we have a God that will guide us through. That will protect us. To help us do the job that you set before us that we might have a desire to serve you in all that we do. Father, we thank you for salvation. We thank you so much that you have set us free, that you've broken the bonds, the chains that bind us, that we might have life. Father, I pray that we'll rejoice in that today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brother Kevin, you come. Please turn to hymn 155 and stand up when you get there. Let's open up here if you want to come up and pray and lay your heart out to Christ. Here we go. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. <clears throat> Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still unto have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence. Humbly I bow on the last. Have thine own way, Lord. 
have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Amen. If you bow your heads, we'll dismiss the church. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Uh, I do thank you for last Wednesday service. That really gave me a nice boost to get, finish out the week. Uh, thank you for today for the messages. Uh, help us to hide them in our hearts that we might not sin against you. And so we can go out and be the light and the salt for the earth, Lord. And in your, in your son's name, Jesus, I pray that you keep us all safe and guide us through the next week and help us to come back as soon as often as we can. And we just praise your holy name, God. We say amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.